Hello and welcome to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. Every week, Talking Heads will bring you in-depth insights and analysis through the lens of sustainability on the topics that really matter to investors. In this episode, we'll be discussing investing in the water sector. I'm Andrew Craig, co-head of the Investment Insights Centre, and I'm delighted to be joined by Justin Winter, co-manager of the water strategy at Impacts Asset Management. Welcome back, Justin, and thanks for joining me. Thanks, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. After the summer we've just had, I think we're all aware that we face a major challenge with the world's water resources under strain. There's a significant gap between the supply and demand, as well as concerns about quality and the age of infrastructure. Now, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals seek to improve infrastructure, responsible consumption and access to water and sanitation. It's great to have this opportunity to discuss with you the impact of recent events on investing in the water space. We continue to see the impacts of climate change in more severe droughts and flooding. What are the implications for investing in the water space? So, as you say, we've seen some really dramatic impacts from climate change, particularly in in the past few years. And it is important for us as investors to separate the very significant events from ones that are relevant for us as investors. So, for example, the the floods in, in Pakistan this summer where over 30 million people were displaced and almost 2,000 people were were killed. That That's you know, a tragic consequence of climate change, but not something that's directly relevant for investing. It does offer an insight, though, because the causes of that were linked to to climate change. So, you know, a really severe heat wave in South Asia that led to glacier melt higher than the normal in the Himalayas and then a heavier than usual monsoon all linked to climate change. And what it also shows is this idea of, of drought and deluge being connected with climate change. There's not just about water scarcity. It's also, you know, as we saw in Europe this summer where we had severe droughts. The summer before we had the, the flash flooding around the northwest of Germany and in, and in Belgium and similarly in the western United States, which have had the driest 20 years since at least 800 AD. So in places like Europe and in the US, it's more economically consequential, and that's where the investment drivers come in for us. So when we think about the solutions to these joint problems of too little water and too much water, that maps across onto the four categories of solution providers that we see. So infrastructure, so pumps and pipes and, and all of that sort of stuff. And that relates to storm water. So there's, you know, too much water arriving and, and having to deal with that in a better way than we've needed to in the past. But it also ties in on the scarcity side with, on one hand, efficiency, so making best use of the water that we've got, but also things like reusing water. So that means more treatment. So those sort of three categories of infrastructure, treatment and efficiency are all sort of very much providing solutions to climate change. And then the final bucket is utilities, which are really tied up to all of those, providing safe drinking water and and dealing with wastewater and connected to that as this higher stormwater. So corporate goals are an important part of driving that solution as well. So we do see companies acting. We see lobby groups such as Ceres with the Valuing Water Initiative, um, and they've approached 72 companies with very high water footprints um, to help improve their disclosure and their management of water. And this really offers an insight into how broadly water is used in the economy. So if you look within those 72 companies, the broad range of industries, so companies include Apple, it includes Levi Strauss, it includes Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, Heineken, Alphabet, Water is used everywhere in the economy. There's almost no economic activity that doesn't have water involved in it. And companies are becoming more proactive and responding to regulation to help deal with that. So we're going to see more of that going forward and more demand for the solution providers that that we're investing in. Have there been any significant changes in legislation that are relevant for water? Yeah, definitely. So this touches on two things. So one is the more immediate sort of stimulus, if you like, around climate change and, you know, broad public support for doing something to deal with that. But also in many parts of the world, a long period of underinvesting in infrastructure. And we're seeing the consequences of that where the infrastructure that we have can't deal with this higher demand being put onto it. So in the US, for instance, there's the American Society of Civil Engineers and they put out a a report card on, on infrastructure every few years to show that some progress has been made. We can see that last year's report, so it was the first time in 20 years that 
the infrastructure was given a higher than a D rating, so it was a C minus, but but um but better than than D. But what they also do is is sort of quantify this sort of investment gap. So the latest uh, report they put out showed that that was now up to 2.6 trillion in the US, so 2.6 trillion dollars, and you know heading out to about 2040, that means about 3,300 dollars per household of infrastructure investing gap that needs to be made up. So we've seen progress towards addressing that, but more recently, some much bigger stuff. So for instance, in the in the US, again, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So that's the largest federal investment in water infrastructure since the 1970s. And if we go back to the 1970s, that's when we had a lot of environmental legislation come through for, for the first time. So the Clean Water Act and the, and the Clean Air Act and, and other pieces of, of legislation. So, you know, there was a peak then and then it's sort of fallen off, but now a big boost to that again. So sort of direct investment in water infrastructure there includes $55 billion dollars including $15 billion for replacing lead service lines. So again, this is highlighting the underinvestment and, and having infrastructure that isn't appropriate anymore. Up until the 1970s, lead was used to link buildings and factories with the, with the distribution network. And that can, you know, having lead leach out into the water can have very severe health impacts, particularly for children. So it's $15 billion in there to deal with that. And then another $10 billion for dealing with a group of chemicals called PFAS. So PFAS, chemicals that have been used for about 60 years or, or so, they're also known as forever chemicals. And some of the properties that make them great for applications such as um, in Teflon or in firefighting foam also mean that they don't break down in the environment and they accumulate in us if we ingest them. And they have been shown to have very um, negative health consequences. So there's, there's 10 billion in that package for dealing with PFAS and other emerging contaminants as, as well. So, you know, there are other parts of the act that also touch on water. So, you know, investment in infrastructure such as roads and bridges and, and rail and, and the power network, all those things also drive demand for more water products. But the direct investment in, in water infrastructure is, is about 55 billion. We've also had other things such as the EU Water Framework Directive, which has been around for, for several years now. But the important thing here is that it's focused on outcomes rather than sort of measuring the input of contaminants into the system. So that means that as the public's view about, you know, what a good outcome is evolves, then that can help drive addressing issues as well. So, so bathing water quality is something that's increasingly coming under focus for the general public. And then again, in, in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the second sort of major package from the, the Biden administration. It's got $4 billion in there for dealing with drought mitigation specifically and with priority given to states in the Colorado Basin, so in the, in the West, where they're having that really severe drought. So, you know, lots of legislation addressing both climate change and also this sort of underinvestment in infrastructure that has you know, direct um, positive impacts for companies providing water solutions. What are the implications for water investing of what's happening in the broader economy? That's a great question and obviously a topical one at the moment. So companies providing solutions for water aren't immune to, to economic cycles, so they are dependent on economic activity. But within the universe, so the opportunity set, there is a good range of companies, including ones that are more cyclically exposed and ones that are more defensive. So on the defensive side of things, that will include industries such as pharmaceuticals and, and consumer staples and other areas where, you know, whether or not there's a recession, the demand for those products and services remains and, and the solution providers around water still have demand for what they're doing. Also on the infrastructure side of things, the investment programs tend to be multi-year, so they're longer than, say, than a contraction in the same way that they don't necessarily boom at the peak of broader economic cycle as well. So that provides some ongoing demand for water solution providers. So not immune, but within that opportunity set, we do have more defensive business models that provide ongoing earnings and earnings growth for the strategy. And another thing that's happening sort of slightly outside the shorter term, if you like, sort of recessionary environment that we're possibly in in Europe already and maybe heading into in the US and sort of things a bit slower in China for different reasons. But longer term trends such as onshoring are also important in the water industry. So here we're seeing more focus on building semiconductor fabs, for instance, in Europe and in North America and being less reliant on East Asia, where most of the production capacity has been for many years. And when we see all these announcements about new semifabs being put up in places like um, Ohio or wherever else they're going in the US and, and in Europe, 
then a good part of the investment in there is for water treatment. So when you've got a plan of about, say, 20 billion for a fab, something like that, something in the order of 5 to 8% will be around water. So both delivering out pure water that's used in manufacturing of chips, but then also the treatment so that the water can be reused as well. So it ties into that theme I spoke about earlier about corporate actors both recognising that water scarcity is, is here to stay and also sort of doing their part to help resolve the issues sort of more generally in the economy. So we've got those sort of themes that cut through the economic cycle, if, if you like. So there will be some impact for sure around areas like, like construction, but there are sort of defensive end markets as well. And, you know, water as a theme, you know, is, is very much about the here and now, but it is a multi-decade issue. People have always needed water and will for the future as well. I think it's very clear from our conversation that there are a very diverse range of opportunities across consumer and industrial end markets in developed and emerging markets. Well, Justin, thanks very much for joining me. It's a pleasure to speak with you again. That's it for this week's episode of Talking Heads. If you would like more information, please reach out to your BNP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out Viewpoint, our new website for investment insights, at viewpoint.bnpparibar-am.com. If you like Talking Heads, leave us a positive review and a nice rating. We recommend subscribing to Talking Heads on your favorite podcast channel. You'll receive your podcast episodes every Monday afternoon. You've been listening to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast with me, Andy Craig, and Justin Winter, co-manager of the Water Strategy at Impacts Asset Management. Please do join us next week. Until then, take care. This presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BNP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.